I doubt it. I doubt it. Doubt. Doubt is such a huge part of our culture, isn't it? I mean, doubt has always been an important part. I don't want to say important, but a real part of the human experience, hasn't it? I mean, we, we just doubt things, and that's normal. And doubt isn't always bad. Doubt can lead us to press in and get answers to important questions. But in our culture today, man, everyone's a skeptic. Everyone's a cynic. We doubt everything. And it's had really tough and difficult and devastating, really, impact on us as individuals and as a culture. You see, there's these things that people have been asking themselves since the beginning, right? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Who am I, right? These are like the foundational questions that we've asked ourselves. And the answers to those questions give us either a strong foundation and a confidence to live our lives and build strong and beautiful lives, or if the answers we get to those questions are not strong, and we don't have confidence in those question, answers to those questions. Our lives are unsettled. In fact, it's like a foundation. I got this picture of Sam, this largest skyscraper in San Francisco. And that's the foundation. Those little things are people. Those are people. And see, the idea, we understand this in buildings, is that if you want a large tall, strong structure, you must have a deep and strong foundation. And yet so many people today do not have answers to the fundamental questions about existence and who they are and can they be happy and is there a meaning and purpose to life? And because they don't have strong answers they have confidence in, their lives are not strong and beautiful, but unsettled. And so what are the questions that people are asking? They're asking questions from the beginning of time. Where do we come from? I'm not talking about the stork. I'm talking about where does humanity come from? Where is our origin? And for some people, this idea hasn't science disproven Christianity, has really put a, a doubt into their faith. Hasn't science disproven Christianity? We're gonna look at that today. Another question people, another foundational question people ask is, about truth, can we know truth? And today people are like, you can't even know truth, there is no truth. But this idea that is the Bible a credible source of truth, is it credible? And is it claiming that truth about God is arrogant? How arrogant you'd be that you'd say you have the truth? This is a common question people have. How about happiness? How can I be happy? This is desire everyone has. And isn't Christianity excessively restrictive and depriving me of happiness? And the last thing we're gonna look at in the last week of this series is we're gonna look at this idea of identity. Who am I? Pretty important question. And isn't Christianity repressive and an affront to my personal autonomy? I want to be what I want to be. It isn't Christianity restricting me. These are the questions, and the answers to these questions build a foundation for our lives. But what we've seen is what some people call deconstructing, right? People, it's, it, the deconstructionism has gone everywhere all the way into people's faith where they're just stripping away. We can't believe anything. We don't know what's true and we're stripping away. And so many deep thinking young people are just being deconstructed to the point of nothing, stripping everything away and having no confidence in anything. And so as a result of throwing off the answers to these foundational questions and sometimes saying you can't even get the answers to these questions, some people would say, and as a result of that, what's happened to our culture and so many people that we love, including a lot of us in this room? We're restless. I mean, in a time in history when we have the most time-saving devices and the most leisure time, I mean, in 1880, people were working an average of 60 hours a week. And if you don't own your own business, you need to start your own business. You're not working 60 hours a week. I think in America, it's like 33 hours a week now is the average work week. So... We're working less, we have more time-saving devices, and yet we can't sleep. <clears throat> Not just we can't sleep, but even when we're awake, we have a restlessness about us. We know something's not right in our own soul, and we're not having peace. As a result of rejecting the answers, these traditional answers to the questions that we had before, we have so much psychological strain. I mean, look, what we have more counselors, more therapists, more resources than we've ever had, and yet, 
We have more depression, more anxiety, more mental illness, more addiction. What's going on? There's not a foundation. The, the answers to the financial questions people have lost confidence in. And so what else has happened? We become a culture of fear. We become a culture of fear. When we have the least reasons to be fearful. Do you know that you're safer today than any other time, especially young people? Pete Nicholas, in his book, A Place for God, goes over all these studies relating to all those things I just mentioned about how even today, young people today are more safe than they've ever been in the history of the world, and yet we're so full of fear. 75% of Americans are more afraid than people were 20 years ago. What's going on? Well, we've rejected or we don't have good answers to the fundamental questions about our life. And we've deconstructed our faith and we have no confidence to move forward. And so we're gonna be doing the next, today and the next three weeks, a series called I Doubt It. We're gonna look at timeless questions for modern times. We're gonna ask those really important questions and see if we can't have more confidence. My hope for you is that you would leave this morning encouraged and having more confidence to build a life strong and beautiful. Does that mean you're never gonna have doubts? No, of course not. Doubt is a normal part of life. But to have a light, but to have strong answers to the questions. Because I do believe there is a good foundation. And I want to start with this uh, image that I've seen on, you know, uh, uh, T-shirts, and but I've seen them on people's homes, on their, uh, you know, little, you've seen these, right? Very political, oops, yeah, real political thing. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of any of this stuff. In fact, I only want to get to the very top line, science is real. And I think when people put that up, what they're usually saying is, what the statement they're trying to make usually is that the global warming is real, and I don't want to get into that either. What I want to get into is, yeah, am I disappointing some of you guys? Like, let's get into that. Yeah, I want to fight. Let's go. <clears throat> but I want to get into this idea that science is real. Because what's behind that? Not just, a, you know, are we global warming or you believe that or not? But the idea that science plays such an important place in our culture and in what we trust in. And the confidence that so many people put in science. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But so the title of this first message for the series is Science is Real. Science is Real. And the question we're going to be looking at is a question of Oregon. Oregon? Ooh, careful. I said Oregon. Easy. Um, origin. Thank you. I'm glad this is the one going out on uh, YouTube and recording. <laughs> but the question of origin is so important. I mean, what are the two stories we have out there? What are the two stories we have? What are the two truths about where you come from? Well, one is that through the primordial slime, I don't know, this, this things came together that possibly could, the, 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 the ingredients to life just kind of fell together over billions and billions of years and eventually the most basic cell was created and then from there more complex cells, all by accident, all without design, meaning, or purpose, over billions of years, you and I now, a series of accidents are here. There is no absolute truth. There is no absolute meaning to life or purpose. You have to decide that for yourself. You're just an accident. But I can tell you this. If there is no truth and there is no meaning or purpose, I have to make it up myself. I have to discover it, make it. I don't have a lot of confidence in that. And I think that's why people are unsettled. What's the other truth or origin of truth, that be, the claim of truth about origin? What is it? It's that there is a God who created the universe and he created humanity in his image, male and female. And there was the fall where humanity broke away from God and he, brought, he, he, he couldn't stand that separation so he brought Christ into the world. His son died so that we could have forgiveness of sins and be reunited and then, he, and then he invites us into that amazing ministry of bringing other people back into that relationship with God. Those are the two stories. You're an accident 
or you were created on purpose. Those are the two stories. And you know, if you're a comic book fan or you love fiction, you know backstory is a really important thing, right? You know, all the comic books have great backstories to the characters. Every writer of fiction knows you've got to get into the backstory because it's so important. Because our origin, what we believe about where we came from, is so important because it shapes the decisions we make. It shapes not only the decisions we make, it shapes our identity. Not only our identity, but it shapes the va- our view of the world and ourselves and our future direction. So it is very fitting that we start with this really fundamental question about where do we come from? because it answers so many other questions. And for so long, we've been told that science and faith, science and Christianity for our purposes, but science and religion, whatever, are incompatible. You either are a confidence in science and you don't believe in religion or faith or Christianity, or you have faith in Christianity, but you, don't, you can't have both. And this is a false narrative that has been pushed on us for many years. But I want to correct that today for you. You see, this is an accurate statement. Science and Christianity. It's not science versus Christianity. Maybe you've heard this and been intimidated by the science versus Christianity. You know, the origins of science, the scientific movement, are in, its roots are in Christianity. I don't have a long time to develop this, but this is a true statement when I say that until the biblical view of God came into human beings, we were not able to see the universe in an orderly way so that we could say, hey, it's time for us. I mean, we can discover God's pattern because it's orderly. We can look at the natural laws of how God's established the universe. In fact, this verse, great are the works of the Lord. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. This idea that we can study the works of God and there are laws we can discover. This is why the West exploded with science where the rest of the world didn't because its framework is rooted in a Judeo-Christian worldview. Are you with me? You understand? And so to say that Christianity and science or religious science are at a post, this doesn't make sense, especially when you look at all the eminent scientists who are Christian. And if, you, and if you'd imagine that science is an opposition to Christianity, you'd imagine that most scientists would agree. And yet this amazing study came out from Rice University saying the opposite, that there's not a tension. In fact, look what it said. And by the way, if you want a link to the study, it's, worth, it's a good read. It's in the app. You just tap that and it'll take you to Not now. It'll take you there. It's a great read. Only 29% of U.S. scientists themselves thinks religion and science are in conflict. Only tw- less than a third. And yet the narrative we've been told is you cannot be, there is a, there is a conflict. Less than a third. In, even in Great Britain, there's only 33% of scientists. That's a very secular country. So this idea that science, scientists don't believe or have a contrast or conflict with religion, think they're opposing each other, is simply not true. There are some, a small vocal group, and I'll say they practice something called scientism, that try to look at science and have science do something it's never been designed, it's never been designed and incapable of doing. And that is giving a grand theory for everything. That we can look to science, we don't need religion, we don't need philosophy, we don't need any other discipline, simply science will give us everything we need. And that is scientism. And it comes from a atheistic, materialistic view. That all we have, there's no God, there's no supernatural, all we have is the material world. And so every answer we get has to come within that. And if, there is, if there's evidence for supernatural, we reject it because there cannot be supernatural. If all the evidence and logic shows that was a miracle, Christ raised him did. If all the historical evidence shows that, we simply cannot acknowledge it and it cannot exist because we do not acknowledge supernatural. <coughs> Pardon me. This scientism goes far beyond what science can do. Science can't tell you what's good or bad. It can't tell you what you ought to do or shouldn't do. It can't, it's incapable. And if it tries to, it's, it's beyond science. It's now a faith and a philosophy. It's no longer science. In fact, I think it takes a lot more faith to believe scientism than to have faith in the word of God, in the Bible.
Let's get back to this idea of origins. Where do we come from? The irony is that for a long time we've been told, some, some have told us, that there's this conflict and that science disproves Christianity or disproves the Bible. But do you guys know what's happened the last 30 years, 40 years? There's been an overwhelming, bit by bit by bit by bit, an overwhelming volume of scientific discovery that leans and points so strongly to a creator. And then what we used to think, oh, that threatens my faith. Now, if you look at science, it bolsters and, and strengthens your confidence in your faith. I want to recommend a book to you called Atheism is Dead, or Is Atheism Dead? by Eric Metaxas. It's just a great book. And in that book, he goes through uh, five things. Actually, I'm just going to cover four things that he, that he says science strongly points to a creator. It makes it more and more difficult to say you're a, an atheist. First one, four reasons. The first one is the Big Bang. You've heard of the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang Theory. In fact, you know the Big Bang, the name was a derogatory term. Scientists, some, scientism, people that practice scientism, don't like the idea of the Big Bang, but they can't avoid it anymore. It's completely 100% accepted. It's been so proven. They don't like the idea of a Big Bang because it means that something outside of science, something outside of space and time and physics, it's a little weird, something outside of what we know, like natural laws and things, something outside of that created the universe. That's what scientists tell us. That's a fact. They said, that's it. Something outside of space and time did something at a finite point with so much power and so much energy that the whole universe, from that. And that's why someone derogatorily called it Big Bang and it actually stuck. But that is a difficult thing for people who practice scientism because that means that it sounds just like it sounds just like, that's the Big Bang, right? That's my idea of what it looks like. It sounds like in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. It points to a creator. But not only that, it, it, it points to a beginning. And see, remember what so much, so many scientists would try to tell us that, well, all this stuff happened over billions of years. And if it doesn't seem possible, we just add a couple more billion years, right? How did these complex accidents, which normally end in mutations, normally end in death, but over this long a time, they're gonna end in this positive result. We just keep adding zeros and years to it and it, we begin to accept it. But now the universe has a finite beginning and most likely, according to the scientists now, they go, logically, it has a finite ending. And so this is a really powerful argument for a creator. And it is difficult for many people to see any other outcome or logical result. Let me go to another one. Maybe the strongest one currently, and that's the fine-tuning of the universe. Guys, this is fun, and I recommend reading that book, and he does a good job of not making it a science lecture class. He teaches, he tells a story of the people and their theories, and it's really interesting. But this fine-tuning is such a strong argument. The idea, did you guys know that the earth, if the earth was a little bit smaller, we would we would seek to exist. No life would be possible on earth because the electromagnetic field around the earth would not be strong enough to shelter us from a solar winds that strip the atmosphere off other planets. Do you know that if the earth was a little bigger, there would be no life on the earth because just a little bit bigger because the gravity would cause the air to become like, like trying to breathe, it becomes so viscous, it would be like trying to, to, to breathe sand. It would be impossible to breathe. There'd be no, there's so many little things like that is like a, that is not even the size of the moon. If you change the size of the moon, there'd be no life on earth. There's so many, the, the idea that Saturn and Jupiter are like, like offensive linemen blocking the meteors and the asteroids coming into the earth. If they didn't exist, there would be no life on earth. The, 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 the amount of things, see, it used to be, I remember Carl Sagan in the, what was it, the 80s when he came out that video, that series about earth and it's the universe and everything. He said, there's only two things needed for life on earth. Well, there's not just two. There's a ton of stuff needed. And the probability of all these things in the universe all coming together just right fine-tuning so it would allow for 
life is so minuscule. I'm gonna, read, I'm gonna mention some numbers to you and they're, not gonna, they're gonna just, like, you can't even imagine these numbers are. You're not, gonna be, you're not even gonna be able to understand because our minds can't understand these numbers. But the fine tuning of the earth is such a strong evidence. Not just the earth, guys, but the universe. Everything they look at. In fact, there's, did you guys know there, there, there's, there's gravity, there's electromagnetic force, there's strong nuclear force. Isn't this great? Aren't you glad you came to church? And there's weak <laughs> nuclear force. Okay, these are the things that physics, this is what holds the whole universe together. This is what's all made, this is what holds the whole universe together, according to scientists, okay? If you just take two of those, you take electromagnetic force, write this down, this is gonna be a test, and <laughs> electromagnetic, for, electromagnetic force, and uh, um, work with me, strong nuclear force. If you take the calibration of just those two, not four, just those two together, how perfectly they have to be aligned so to allow life. It is the number one. They, these guys, these physicists, figure this out. I don't know, I'm not the mathematicians. One in 10 to the 16th power. Oh, the 16th power. Oh my gosh. So for people like me, they tried to explain it. And one of the things they, they said is, okay, here, imagine this. Imagine you have a friend and you want to give, you want to have him pick out a red dime. And you say, I want you to pick this red dime out, but I'm going to cover all of America in dimes and you got to pick it out. But no, wait, not just in Alaska. We don't want to leave Alaska out, do we? Okay. And Mexico and Central America. You got to, we're going to put it, you got to find it in there, Okay. And you're blindfolded, by the way. So you got to find it in there. But then you tell your friend, before you start, we're going to take those dimes that are covered all this continent, you know, North America, Canada. Oh, did I mention Canada? Canada, Alaska, uh, America, Mexico, all that continent. We're going to cover it as high until you can't see Mount McKinley anymore. 20,000 feet. And then you say, wait, 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 wait. Before you go... And you try to find that dime blindfolded in the 20,000 feet of dimes. I want you to go and make it not just 20,000 feet. I want you to make it 24,000 feet. What? 24,000. No, nope, I was wrong. 200 and thank you. 240,000 feet. Now it's 240,000. Now it's getting pretty hot. And before you tell your friend, go and try to find it, you say, wait a minute, not 240,000 feet. We're going to go 240,000 miles high. And then you got, that's, you're touching the moon now. And then you say, wait, before you do that, I want you to get a billion more continents. And that is the number that physicists say, the probability of everything lining up, just these two things, these two forces in nature to allow for life. This is an unbelievably strong argument. And this is why even guys who are antagonistic to Christianity have to acknowledge it. Look at Stephen Hawking said. The remarkable fact is that values of these numbers, i.e. the constants of physics, which I just tried to illustrate, seem to have been finally adjusted to make possible the development of life. Okay, we gotta hurry. This is fun. The fourth, the fourth one, complexity of the cell. I mean, remember when they said, well, these things just roll together and, and these elements were there, the ingredients for cell, for life to happen, and somehow they just kind of did their thing in, in the protoplasm. There's no such thing as proto protoplasm. They made it up. They didn't, know, they didn't know what was in cells that well. They just call it protoplasm. No such thing. Because the cell is so complex. The mechanisms of the cell are so complex. Even the most simple cell the scientists look at that and they say, there's no way this could have possibly ever happened by accident. All this stuff has to work, and I'm out of time. Look at, look at here's another, uh, maybe the best known atheist, the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Give the appearance, because even though everything points to a creator of intelligent design, some people, because they are scientism, they cannot accept that. They will not accept that. Another one he points to is archaeology, and I'm going to go really fast. I've said this a lot of times. You can find the place in the Bible. You can find evidence for the characters in the Bible. You want to, you the newest one right now, Sodom. Sodom. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? They're pretty sure they found it. In fact, they're 100% sure. It's just crazy. Look that up. 
It's in the book, too, if you can get the book. So look at all this evidence makes Eric Metaxas, who's a very well-respected man, say this. At the beginning of his book, he says, his goal is that atheism, is he wants to convince you and help you understand at this book, that atheism, atheism, mm -hmm, atheism is no longer an option for those wishing to be regarded as intellectually honest. That's a pretty bold statement. What I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping for you to understand that faith in the creation that God tells us is not being undermined by science, it is being supported by science. Now, I wanna to get to the part I've been waiting for this whole time. What does God say about your origin? Then God said, let us, and let us, let us. Who's he talking about? A trinity. I mean, think of this is really wild. Moses wrote this before God revealed the trinity, and yet it still says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over. What? What? We were created by God in his likeness, in his image. What does that mean? What is God? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a trinity. Individually and yet all equally one. And they live in community. Listen, this is the most important part of the whole message. Relationship. They live in relationship and they said, we want to create humanity to be like us in relationship. That we are building and growing. Growing. We are creating something that can have a relationship like we can with us. That is a revolutionary, crazy, world-changing life Life-changing idea. Listen to me. You, you take this for granted because you've heard it in Sunday school or you heard someone telling you were growing up. God created you for relationship. This is unbelievable. And not only that, it says, and over the cattle, I mean, quick time. God created man in his own image. In his own image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God created them. And God, and God, excuse me, God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Not only did he create you for relationship, listen to me. He created you for a purpose. You have a meaning and a purpose. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He blessed them, he gave them authority, and he said, go and make disciples. Our job from the beginning of time, we were created for relationship primarily, to know him, and we were created to have a purpose to make him known, to bring his order into the earth. You were designed by God on purpose for relationship and productivity. I don't know what you've been taught in school. I don't know what the enemy told you in your life, but I'm here telling you right now, science points to a creator and that creator wants you to know right now, you were created for relationship with him and other people. And not just that relationship, but a purpose. Listen to this, before I formed you in the womb, God spoke this to the prophet Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What kind of a God are we talking about here? The world has never known this God to reveal himself. No other God has ever claimed these things. I knew you, you right there, before you watching. Before you were born, I knew who you were. Before you were even formed in the womb, I knew who you were. You were created for a relationship and you were created for a purpose. And this will change your life. I was reading this book called The Storyteller's Secret and I forgot the author, Carmine something, great book. But he had a section in there and he said, years ago, it said, change your story, change your life. Do you understand why this idea of origin is so important? If you really are just an accident, then whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you've been designed, finely tuned, like our universe, for relationship with God and with people, and you've been given a mission to be productive and bring God's order, 
you will live differently. It will change your life. So here's my challenge. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. Now all these things are from God who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All who are in this room who have come and received Christ and now are in relationship with the Father, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Let me just say something to you. Are you living like a functional atheist? Are you living your life as if the, the, there's the God, you weren't designed for a relationship with God, or you weren't designed for a purpose to bring God's order and love and life into the world? You're living your life so that you can just get more stuff and more experiences? Because you were created for a relationship. And you were created to be productive. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to join us as a church. To quit acting like you weren't created for a relationship and you weren't created for a purpose. And acting like everybody else, like a functional atheist. Yes, I believe in Christ. Yes, I believe there's a God. But I live my life like it's all about stuff and experiences. And press in to this relationship that you were created for. And press in to the purpose of God that you were created for. And quit, pretend, quit playing church. Quit playing Christian. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal. He is through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, Paul says, be reconciled to God. So I have two challenges this morning. One for you Christians, for me, for all us Christians in this room, to embrace the purpose of God, to join us in this church, to know him and make him known to quit sitting on the sideline. And listen, the second challenge I have is for the people in this room, the people that are watching, who have never come into relationship with God. Paul says, I beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God wants to reconcile you to him. And he's provided the way, but you have to give in. And so I'm gonna lead us in a prayer in just a moment. I'm gonna lead in two prayers, but I'm gonna lead us in a prayer right now for people to say yes to Jesus. And if you're watching or you're in this room right now, this is how it starts. This is how you begin that relationship. You admit your need for God. You admit your guilt before God that you've done wrong things and you cannot fix yourself. And you cry out to God for mercy to forgive you. And in his grace, he does. So would you bow your heads right now? Maybe you're watching this. It doesn't have to even be alive. Wherever you are, you were created for relationship. It is time now to stop making excuses and stop pushing off and saying science disproves the Bible. No, it doesn't. Science just proves creation. No, it doesn't. So now I just come before you right now. Just pray this prayer quietly between you and God. And the Christians in this room will be praying for you. This is a big decision. Just say, God, pray this in your heart. God, forgive me of my wrongdoing. For living my life as if you don't matter or you don't exist. And just say this, please forgive me. I believe you can because Jesus died for me. Say that to him. And then say, come into my life. I want to follow you. And then I'm gonna pray another prayer. And that is this. For myself and for all of us Christians in this room, you heard the call of God this morning? Clear, you heard it. Are you gonna respond? Say this prayer with God. If you wanna embrace the purpose of God, the relationship and the purpose of God, say this prayer with, just in your heart. Lord, pray with me. God, I no longer want to pretend like I was created for stuff and experiences. Those things are good. You, you can bless me with those things and help me. And, but Lord, I was created for relationship with you first. And with people, forgive me. 
I choose to pursue you first. Lord, forgive me for living as if I'm just here to be comfortable, that I've forgotten the call in my life to join the family business, not just to know you, but to make you known. I am gonna get involved in the reconciliation ministry of people to you. Show me what I am to do, what ministry I am to join, what person I am to speak to. Change my mind today. I ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship. But I want to remind you that on the side of the stage over here, under that cross, is a place you can get prayer. We felt the presence of God as we worshiped earlier. I felt the presence of God as I was preaching. God is here. Don't waste this time. Come over here and get prayer as we sing.